I am for the second welcome today. I believe what well, I know that this full class and probably a great deal of the next um, class will be dealing with this particular artist, Courbet. If you have a much better sense of numbers than I do, or keep them in mind far better than I do, you might notice something just in his name and his birth and death dates. He was born before the artists we've looked at to this point, before Bougereau, before Bougereau's wife, and before Rosa Bonheur by, well, not that many years, a few years. Yet, um, I didn't start with him because the, uh, especially Bougereau represented a kind of art that just um, flowed seamlessly out of the art that preceded his day, or at least the transitions are very gradual. And he was, we have to remember, the most popular painter in the century. Whereas Courbet represents a, a really radical break. And for many people um, who study the history of art, they would say that Courbet's work marks the beginning of the modern era of, of truly modern um, attitudes towards subject, toward the artist, toward the way of painting, towards the whole terrain having to do with, especially with painting. I have several photographs of him to get us started um, by Nadar, the great Parisian, especially portrait photographer. Uh, so here is Courbet as a young man, see, quite, quite full of himself. And why don't we start with one of his um, statements about himself? He said, I am the most arrogant man in France. And there is no doubt that his ego was enough to tide him through some very turbulent times and lead him into territory that was totally uncharted. Uh, he, was, um, he was an outsider in many ways. Um, in a moment, we'll show you the map of France so you can see where he came from and then a view of the town where he came from. But he, he came from, he was not from Paris. Um, his father was, a, came from a peasant family, but had done very well, owned quite a lot of, of property, he was a farmer and owned vineyards, um, just a, a, a provincial luminary in his way. And Courbet had three sisters whom he adored, um, and then his mother. And Courbet was very close with his family throughout his life. Well, very affectionate with him. So when, his, when he was young, his father wanted him to be a lawyer. Well, that would have been in the normal ladder of coming through the classes of society, that would have been the next rung, and that would have been a very good career. But Courbet took a few art classes, went to school, didn't like it at school, persuaded his father to let him study at a regional art school, which he did. And Courbet proclaimed that he wanted to be an artist. His father agreed, and uh, his father agreed to support him, which is a really kind of an extraordinary. Well, I'll tell the rest of that story once we see the photo, uh, the painting of his father. But so so Courbet did not attend the Ecole de Beaux Arts, did not try to get into the Ecole de Beaux Arts, did not study in Paris. But he comes from a provincial environment, and well, he will ultimately move to Paris and move people in Paris. But he was very proud uh, of, of his background and maintained those ties throughout his life. Uh, 
he was a persistent fellow and trying to get into the art world. He would submit things to the salon since you've heard how many times now I'm saying that that's the only way that, that an artist could expect to make a, a lucrative career was to get that uh, approval that came through being in a salon. Well, he had works turned down and turned down and turned down and then he got one in and then it was turned down and turned down and he just persisted. I mean, he always tried and then we'll see he succeeded in showing inflammatory uh, works in the salon. Uh, in, but he, he doesn't have to sort of abandon the training in classical art. He did not have that. So he comes at art from a different background and he is, mm, he owes no allegiance to that Renaissance oriented rational art that was espoused by the Academy, not just in France, but in other areas in Europe as well. To give you an idea of the course of his life, here he is in middle years. and late in life. Having the pipe is, oh, he was a totally addicted smoker, so he often has that. But you see a man who must have immensely enjoyed life as, as much as he enjoyed his work and enjoyed everything he threw himself into. Um, he did, uh, he was from the beginning, even before he wanted he didn't choose for himself to be um, aligned with political causes. He was very much at the beginning and the end of his career uh, associated with um, progressive and radical political and social thinking. And late in his career, he got involved in the French well, Parisian Revolution of 1870. That was the Franco Prussian War in which Paris developed a commune that fought against the rest of France. And although I mean, Courbet never fought, but his ideas were very prominent. And after the Paris commune was vanquished, um, the regular French government um, put him in jail for six months. Then subsequently he was charged to pay for the re-erection of a public monument that the commune had, had torn down. So he, at the end of his life, had to flee to Switzerland because other, I mean, they were gonna um, seize all of his property, all his goods, and all his considerable fortune at that time. So his career goes from peasant, revolutionary in art, associated with revolution in society, to exile. Uh, tremendous prominence in between. I think it's quite possible we don't get beyond sort of the first 15, about 15 years of his career today, because that's when the most provocative, most startling works were produced. But here, so his, it comes from the area right here below Besançon, very close to Switzerland, which is a considerable distance in Paris. Then he's going to have a great patron who comes from down here at Montpellier, and there are a number of Courbet paintings in the museum down there. So this is a, an area of limestone cliffs, lots of rivers, caves. Um, a very beautiful area of France. I mean, it's known to be very beautiful. And this is the town where he grew up on this river. And he does many paintings of this river, the source of the river, areas along the river in the wilder areas of it. And we'll see how often in the background of his paintings, there are cliffs just like this. His, his family's house is still there. I think it's just mm, a little bit farther down the river here. And here's one of the earliest known works by him. Looking at this, I said, oh, 
What's revolutionary about that? Absolutely nothing. This work shows that he did have a conventional, if provincial, training in art. Uh, it's a very competent drawing of his father. Here's a, a portrait of his father. And the father and son are very, very close. Um, this follows the rules about how you would create a painting like this. Um, and you're, as a young artist, he's able to skirt some of the difficulties by showing the figure, especially his face in almost in complete profile. Um, you, you don't have to deal with the, the distortions that come in our vision when we see a face at an angle or say with the nose coming toward us instead of to the side. And that's one reason why coins show profiles of heads because that's the most descriptive um, or I wanted photographs to have that. And uh, so that's a, perhaps a sign that this could be handled by a young artist, but it's uh, very nicely painted. The modeling is very good. Um, you get the sense that there's a background because there's this kind of light. You get the sense that there's some light that's hitting the face and then um, it goes on into a background. So there's some sort of something some sort of depth to it, despite the profile view of the figure. And you have the sense you would recognize this person if you saw him. Now I'm going on at length about that because later Courbet's paintings don't look at all like this. I also want, want to say more than about his father, Regis Courbet. I think who could ever expect to have such a blessing as his father provided for his son. And Courbet said he wanted to be a painter. His father not only, well, of course this is secondhand, thirdhand information, but his father not only agreed to that, but said, you'll give up on yourself before I give up on you. And that also the father agreed to back him to whatever extent was necessary even it would mean selling all the family lands. So this sets Courbet apart from Boucherot, Boucherot's wife, most other artists right away. Uh, there'll be other artists we, we look at that are in similar situations, however, that he doesn't need to worry about making money by selling paintings. Um, he has the sort of financial comfort that he could experiment, explore, um, try to make his name rather than his income. But of course he, um, to make his name, he needs to get into the salon. And as I said, he tried repeatedly, he did move to Paris and he tried repeatedly to submit and the paintings would be rejected. Then this was the first one that was accepted in, in the salon. And it's just a self-portrait with a black dog. There, Courbet did almost as many self-portraits as Rembrandt did. And it kind of goes with this concept. I'm the most arrogant man in France. <clears throat> but here he shows himself as that handsome young devil. Uh, out on a country walk with his pipe, um, presumably a sketchbook, a walking stick, and his beloved dog uh, going through his native countryside because there the limestone cliff is behind him. Now, it's painted in a very different way. This has um, <clears throat> this figure, his eyes, part of his face sh in shadow, and he looks out and down at us, very much a young man of attitude. That shaded face, that, that sort of comes from Rembrandt. And he had made, he made a trip to, to Holland. So he was very aware of Rembrandt's paintings. But you have this strong contrast of dark and light. It's a, it's a, it's a very vivid painting and it very much presents uh, probably a person in, in a pose. And certainly he would not be looking at himself like this. This is an, um, there's no mirror on this. This is his uh, projected self-portrait. 
but it's a very nice painting. It's not object objectionable, I think, by in any uh, degree to anyone. So he was very pleased. Next year, he tried to get in, didn't. Year after that, tried to get in. I think he didn't that year either. Well, he didn't stick with the style of that slightly romanticized artist out in nature. This is Hill's self-portrait too. It now just goes by the name of Portrait of a Desperate Man. So like Rembrandt, who does the same thing, which is to show his face in a whole gamut of expressions, including ones of, of panic and terror and rage. Uh, here you have this melodrama in the way Courbet presents himself. Uh, as he's, what is he doing? Tearing his hair or is he arranging his hair? You see his eyes popping forward, the glint in them. Um, it's, it's just very different. It's quite loosely painted. You can see where sometimes, say, let's take this white or the gray painted, well, put the white over the gray. You can see that the brush sort of runs out of paint there and the gray shows out underneath. So he's, he's not trying that careful gradation of color the glazing so one tone moves into the other as would be done in, um, say, a Bougereau. So you have that kind of expression. The year after that, he does this. Who would think a person who produces that is very, he makes his signature quite noticeable in all his work. I think almost all of it. Then he does this. Tight, controlled, fairly icy, with, um, it looks like a primitive painting. There is something wrong in her proportions. And then look at the size of her head compared to her hands or the arms here, or the rather awkward, turn and not quite accurate foreshortening of the chair. This is his sister, his, his favorite sister. So what accounts for this? Well, now he does something in the more local, archaic, put in quotes, primitive style. So he's done romantic, dramatic. Now he's gonna do old fashioned, archaic, primitive, provincial. He's casting about to find himself. What is going to be, what is going to fit him? So just a year after that, he does this. This is now his three sisters. It's called, um, well, it's about just three, three women talking with, um, an old gossip, or no, sisters with this gossip. And it's not very big, it's about two feet high. This is unlike any, either of the other works or any of the works you've looked at so far with very subdued coloring, uh, sort of a, some setting, but pretty negligible setting. No action, but he now can show someone from the back and he's trying to show that foreshortened arm. And it shows another place he's beginning to look for inspiration since it's not going to come from anything in the Ecole de Beaux-Arts. He is looking at Dutch, Dutch, Spanish 17th century painting, which was just beginning to come into greater popularity, um, maybe in the 1840s. So he's looking at what is quite popular and it's, for example, this sort of the simplicity, the rusticity. This would be like a 17th century Spanish artist, Ribera. I believe this is one of the works by Ribera that's in the Louvre, which he would have seen. And oh, by the way, Courbet did 
like so many others, did go to the Louvre to, to learn from artists there. He, he didn't cleave only to provincial background. And although he didn't see this particular painting, Velasquez, water bearer of Seville, he did look at many other paintings by Velasquez, where this, especially in early ones, which often were peasant scenes, where there's a dark background and figures come out <clears throat> from almost being submerged in the, in the darkness into the light in very simple scenes here, almost like a sacramental image of offering water. You see, that's... Uh, Although this is contemporary events, it has a flavor of the things that <clears throat> Velasquez was doing. And here's another one of his self-portraits. Still the romantic man. Now this is about 1848, a few years later, still, of course, smoking his pipe. Um, the figure emerging from that darkness. I don't know how well you can see his eyes, but um, he's looking out and down at us. <clears throat> There's a sense of a slight smile in his mouth. Mm, some people read a little of the pose possibly, but of his attitude of a slight superiority to us in this. It's really a quite fine portrait. And then this, oh my. This is what did it for him. Uh, it's called the Dinner at Ornan. Now the town where he grew up is O-R-N-A-N-S, Ornan. <clears throat> this made it into the salon. Not only did it, make it into the song. He had had one accepted a year before, uh, which he didn't think enough about to preserve it. He in fact painted over it a couple years later. So this is the first one that survives that was uh, accepted into the salon. Not only was it accepted, but it won a silver medal. And I have not yet talked about exactly what being a medal winner would do for you if in the salon, other than add luster to your vita, it meant that whenever you submitted anything else to the salon, it would no longer be judged by the jury. It would be automatically accepted. So he's thrown himself against the, that, the walls of the salon and he's made it through. This painting in itself, looking at it, might not strike us as well, it's not so different of the, than the sisters talking to the old gossip. But let me tell you the size of this painting. Seven feet, four inches high by eight feet, five inches wide. It's a big painting. We're talking at figures who are life size. This is in the salon. Are people Parisian salon goers that, that great social and cultural event of the year for people in Paris, where the ladies are they're wearing their latest and best clothes and where you go to see be seen? Are people going to the salon supposed to look at figures on the wall who are just as large as they are, dressed like this? as the peasant life that either they have assiduously stayed away from themselves or that are in their background and that they're embarrassed about. Or that was part of the revolution of just the year before in the class struggle in Paris, you know, throughout all of Paris. So this was so in your face. It's a declaration by Courbet that ordinary people, humble people from the provinces are just as worthy of your 
observation and admiration as any classical hero or any scene in the life of Jesus. And that was profoundly unsettling for people. And this isn't a scene that he made up. This is his father, one of his best friends who was a violin player. And we know the name of this friend of his too. So he, he's showing his life, the people he loves, uh, and the, the good part of life in the provinces. They've had a good meal. This man has this marvelous hunting dog snoozing under the chair. He's been out hunting. They've had this conversation. He's sort of nodding off or thinking his own private thoughts, listening to the music here, this figure who looks a bit like Courbet, but I think is not intended to be his self-portrait, uh, listening to it. So it's good food, good company, good cigarette, good smoke anyway, good music, a good day out in the um, out of doors in a world utterly alien to that of people living in Paris. And in this very rough hewn style. So there was precedent for this. I mean, it's not like he's uh, coming out of the brow of Zeus that there was there was nothing like him before. There was, this is actually a, a work by a French painter in the 17th century. There, there are some brothers called the Linnean brothers and their paintings were enjoyed. And this is in the Louvre, in fact. And one of Courbet's best friends who was a art critic was writing a book on the Lernan brothers at this time. So Courbet was very much aware of this, but these paintings were small and these would be uh, meant for the aristocracy. It's sort of like, enjoy look at the, looking at the life of the peasants over whom they, they held um, complete power. So they were um, amusements and um, it's as if these people were their possessions. So in that way, very unlike this. And now Courbet has that magic key to the salon. From now on, whatever he does can get in there. This is the same year that Rosa Bonheur's uh, plowing scene was in the salon. <clears throat> Remember, this was a commissioned painting. But um, so I I'm saying this because I, I don't want anyone to have the sense that, um, or misapprehension that Courbet is the only one doing peasants. There is um, a growing, well, here's like a bad pun, like a little groundswell of interest in showing scenes of the, of the peasant life for um, an urban environment. But here it's not the people, it's the magnificent oxen that are the subject. If you've had a modern art history, I think you will have studied this painting and you can only study it in reproduction because it was destroyed during World War II. It was in Dresden and was loaded on a truck which was carrying the treasures of the, the painting gallery in Dresden for safekeeping out of the city and the truck was bombed and, and the painting was destroyed. So, Almost everything, fortunately, we have this color reproduction, which is then ultimately reproduced again and again and again. So this is simply called the Stone Breakers, and it dates to 1849. So Courbet had been living in Paris, but he went back to Ornan, partly just for the refreshment of returning to family, and he'd been leading a pretty shall we say, tumultuous life of every sort in Paris. So it was a sort of a respite for him. 
And he did, uh, inspired by what he saw when he returned to his native soil, he did two works that are, that, that are just like um, completely earth shaking for their time. And this is one of them. So the size of this is five, uh, five feet, five inches by eight feet, five inches. So it's another big painting. And this is the complete painting. There's no one looking at you. There's not that subtle uh, flattery of this subject of a painting wanting to interact with you, the observer. There is nothing inviting you in this. And what are you, the observer, looking at here? A scene that Courbet said that he saw when he was riding in a wagon back to Ornan, and he saw this exact scene. Uh, this is what he, he wrote to a friend about it. It's not often that one sees such a comprehension, comprehensive depiction of destitution. And so I had the inspiration for work right then and there. I invited them, this boy and then this elderly man, to my studio the very next morning. So these are two people who are breaking up stones to lay a new roadbed in the increasing web of uh, good communication uh, across France as part of the modernization of the country. But it shows how much the people are being left behind. Neither one of these male figures is what you would think of as in the normal age range for hard physical labor. And they are certainly doing hard physical labor and they are destitute. Um, you can see this worn shirt, trousers way too large for this figure, um, shoes too big for him. The sole is loose here. That's the heel of his foot. That's the sole of the shoe down there. This guy wearing the wooden clogs of the peasants. Uh, his tattered jacket. He has a um, waist here. He has a packet of, of uh, tobacco. So he has, that's like a, just a, a real touch in these, you know, what, what Courbet said once, this man, if he got out, the, got out of his trousers, they would stay there in place there. So caked with dirt, dirt. And he's hacking these stones into bits. And then over here, there's their stew pot and a ladle and some bread. So that's their lunch. And it's just unremitting hard labor. What you, um, I see his signature again. He, he, he certainly claims his own work. You can only pick up a, a kind of a, a sense of this here, but when you look at this pile of smaller stones, or um, there must be road work going on of others that we can't see on the site because there's some more equipment and a basket for someone else. Um, the details of the sort of osiers in that basket, um, the stew pot, the way the sleeve is curled up here, the twigs. Each one of these details is done with just as much care and fidelity to observation as the figures are. So, Courbet has not done the conventional, bring out the figures and then you have a setting that describes what they do. Although he does, this makes them far more prominent than their setting. And in that way, he is conforming to say what Bougereau or other artists did at this time is to place the figures kind of like a frieze across the front. And then you have the backdrop behind that. But here it can be explained as well, you're on the road and then that's the edge of the road. So for people sensitive to calls for change in society, um, to a more equal distribution of the benefits of being a French person, this one would be seen as a politically radical painting, a call 
for change. It's not, although it may be just a dispassionate, accurate view, they don't go to museums to look at something dispassionate, accurate about life of people who are suffering. Um, and you think also, this is the time when Marx and Engel wrote the Communist Manifesto. So there's all across Europe, there's that simmering discontent and concern that something needs to be done. I just brought this in because if any of you, well, just pre-COVID had been up to um, the Montclair Art Museum, you would have had a chance to see this. This is by a contemporary Brazilian artist named Vic Muniz, who does um, collages of largely scraps of paper cut from magazines and newspapers, how the work that he chooses to reproduce is precisely this. One thing wonderful about Courbet is being such a provocative figure. And I mean, he provoked, he courted controversy. He, he uh, will ultimately even write letters to the editor and he wanted to make sure that they would get published. He, this is another very modern thing. He wanted the publicity. Um, <clears throat> this is a, a cartoonist who saw in the, when that, Stonebreakers was exhibited in the salon of 1850. He does this of, oh, these would be the paintings that Courbet did, all peasants. And you see how, uh, so these characters, a good way to see what people pick up on and what makes them uncomfortable. To be looking at ugly people, ugly peasants, just peasants in their clogs working at the rocks. So th that wasn't, although it was painted in 1849, it wasn't exhibited in the salon until 1850. And that's not the only work that Courbet will put in the salon of 1850, but 1850 since that's, you know, the nominal date for beginning this class, according to the title. But also I want to remind you, this is what Bougereau was doing in 1850. That's what won him the Prix de Rome that year, the painting which was quite difficult to empathize with from our modern tastes in art. With this perfection in modeling, great handling of skin, infinite detail, all the colors, sketches, all the drawings made in advance. Courbet almost never sketched um, what he was going to paint. He just simply started in and painted. It is the bourgeois row of washerwomen 20 years later. But still, although um, there's, a, there's actually labor going on in this painting, there's no sense of hard labor or suffering but this, this, uh, this is what people with wealth wanted to see. This is what American tycoons liked. Or the very well-known Mie painting of um, the gleaners, poor women <clears throat> who after the harvest are gleaning the scraps in the field, which is their, theirs by legal right. Uh, still a very famous painting. And these, these are showing people men who are also very poor, but how they're poor and noble and they're ennobled by the way Mie paints them. The soft golden light, these harmonious echoing curving forms, the bright colors, the pale colors there, they're prominent in front of this landscape, far back from them. It's work beautified. Now, this is actually a Mie done in 1850. Uh, <clears throat> it's, it's called the Sower, Mie, M I L L E T. And he is another realist. Um, I guess maybe I left it out. So, um, 
I left the most important thing out, perhaps. Courbet becomes the standard bearer for realism. In fact, he publishes articles in which he claims the term realism. And so other artists who then are showing scenes of daily life, like Bonaire with the animals or Millet, not out of the classical past in any way, um, are, are, are realists, but their realism largely uh, involves the subject matter rather than the presentation of the work. And for Courbet, it's through and through realist. This is another work that Courbet showed in the 1850s. So salon goers were confronted with the Stonebreakers and this. Well, you know on this scale that Courbet is again pitting himself with the great works that had been appearing in the salon, these enormous paintings. And this is called The Burial at Ornan, O-R-N-A-N-S. And it's 1850, started a little bit the year before that. I'll give you the size, although from the onlooker, you can get a good sense. It's 10 feet plus and 24 feet long. And the Musée d'Orsay in Paris, I hope there are a number of you who've had the opportunity to stand there and look at this. There are between 40 and 50 life-size figures in this. Most of the people, uh, their identity is still known. So before uh, looking at this particular painting in detail, which there you see the full thing. Uh, briefly talk about the subject, and then I want to show you some other works that were in the 1850 salon so that you have a sense of how different Courbet's works looked on the walls from the other works that were esteemed that were there. So um, Courbet had, was, was back in Ornan, and one reason he had gone was that his, uh, his grandfather, whom he also loved, had died. So he went for the funeral, and he was there just for a couple of weeks, and then his um, great uncle died. So there were these two funerals that gave Courbet the idea of this. It, it is not meant exactly a literal record of either one. For all his being a realist, this can't be writ literal because here's actually a portrait of his grandfather over here. But it is showing a, and it's called a burial in Ornan, a historical scene. That's the, the full title of it. So we're gonna have a lament, lamenting background here. So you recognize the setting, the hills around Ornan. And there was a new cemetery just outside the city that had been created. Um, and the burial was, to, this is a burial that would be taking place there. Uh, the people here, one of his best friend, the violinist is shown as one of these figures. Uh, who are these? Here's the mayor, a quite corpulent figure. These are two men who were sort of old fashioned Republicans, sort of hold over Napoleonic ideas. Uh, this man owned a vineyard and for extra money, uh, dug graves. The beetles for the church, the only two figures of any real color in here. One of them was a shoemaker and I think the other was a, a vintner. Uh, in this crowd are Courbet's sisters and his mother and his father, other friends, other, well, sort of local luminaries of these life-size figures. And they look again as if it's just a procession across the front of the picture. When you look very carefully, that's not quite true. It's like they come over here 
you say things are still happening, although the figures look like a fairly static freeze, because um, this is a little acolyte looking like he's asking for uh, for instructions and what's he to do next? And the priest is opening his little uh, prayer book there, getting the page. And the women over here, well, why would they keep going? They're circling around and they're going to, they're turning and they're coming back because what they're going to do is come and stand on our side of the grave. That's what this lovely dog is watching too, as they're coming around the scene. So it's not going to stay a freeze as the, it will involve where we are, as is the most disconcerting feature in this painting is this. Well, of course, that's the grave. There's a crushed skull and a couple of other bones there that were disinterred during the digging. Well, nobody can fit in that. That's because the grave is oriented so it comes out toward us. It comes out into our space. But is this a meditation on death? Is this a meditation on faith? Well, at least the processional cross is up above the, the level of the horizon there, so it does stand out. But there's, um, well, there are some people dabbing their eyes. There's quite a variety of expressions. Perhaps this is the widow here, more overcome. But for some, no, not so much. When uh, Courbet was asked about all these figures in black against this otherwise very dark painting anyway, so, um, is this just expression of mourning? Is this a one more poetic political thinker said, this is like a mourning for last, uh, lost traditions, lost principles? Courbet said, no, nah, I think when people mourn, they're really, that's ego. They're mainly mourned for themselves. No, I'm just showing the, the burial. And he had each one of these people come up to his studio, which was in the attic of his dead grandfather's house, uh, and pose for him. He, he sort of complained to one of his friends. He couldn't, the painting was so big, he couldn't stand back ever to see the full thing. So there is this kind of additive quality. It's one figure, another figure, another figure, another figure, another figure. So that's that's just sort of a general uh, gives you a chance looking at this while I talk, describe what you're seeing. Now the next two images are in art history literature, really conventional comparisons with the burial or an to point out the burial's extraordinary quality. This is, a, I imagine, also familiar to many. And El Greco, the burial of the Count Orga. So here's the deceased about to be lowered into a grave, which would be outside the picture here. And again, just a row of people across the back. I tell you, Courbet would be aware of this painting. But then there's, you have the realm of the supernatural up above. There's the consolation of life after death, which is made very clear through this. So this is suffused with a religious meaning, which the a-religious or anti-religious Courbet does not admit into his work. Or a kind of a secular religion. Uh, from the time of Napoleon, this painting by David of the death of the radical revolutionary Marat, who was uh, uh, killed in his bath by a woman who had gotten, sent a letter, got permission to see him. And the way the figurehead slips, this arm rums, oh, well, that's Michelangelo's David. So it, there is a suggestion of heroizing this figure, much as he is a real man and it is a real event shown with a very real wooden cart crate right there. So Courbet's, unlike other well-known, familiar to many people, burial scenes. 
unlike other paintings in that salon. So I'll just give you a couple of them from that year. This one by an artist, um, I, I had I, we, we all the time in the world, we'd look at other works by him, a, a man named Marsonnier, who worked at a sort of like a tiny, tiny scale. But this is showing the uh, revolt in, in Paris in 1830 with these bodies here. But it's tiny, precise painting. Or Delacroix, who was still alive and who recognized um, Courbet as uh, an original, as someone of strong force, a force to be reckoned with, someone whose name will become known. Well, Delacroix had this painting, a religious painting of the Good Samaritan in that. So it's a heroic event, bright color. Jerome, remember that teacher of Egan's and in Mary Cassatt, had this in there, a uh, Greek interior. Well, that's more in the line of a Bougereau, isn't it? Another sort of strain of romantic imagery, this by an artist named Chasserio, and it's a scene of Desdemona. Uh, so it's a scene from Otello the romantic heroine who will be slain. Or Corot, a landscape with dancing nymphs. A totally idealized, it's almost like a setting for a ballet. Uh, this the screen of trees back here, and these would be the dancers. There were many, many, many uh, landscapes. We'll look at some from Rousseau next week. Or here's another landscape artist, Domini, who um, does this scene from the Virgin Isles. Do any of those have the confrontational force of this? Oh, of course not. We don't need to look at that yet again. And how did people react? Well, we can look at one of their ca uh, caricatures of that again. This certainly exaggerates the size of Courbet's signature. See, this would be those two men in red, the Beatles. And it's like these um, almost like quotation marks that would be the procession of people, the women with their handkerchiefs to their face and the little dog. What's the commentary here? Oh, the painting's almost unseeable. It's just darkness. He used bitumen and it has gotten darker over time, but it was always dark. Oh, don't need that sketch. This is somewhat better and we get a little closer. Um, I have a few that are somewhat better than this, but you can tell even from here, the painting technique is that he's using a wide brush and thick paint and he's just slathering it on. There is no finesse to the technique. This is done with, with haste. He puts a dark layer against the background and then he just builds the light on it where he needs darkness. He doesn't bother to put paint. See, so just, so there, those folds, that's just, the underlayer still showing through. And these extremely homely beetles right here. See the scale variations? Well, he said, you know, he, he only, he, he did one person a day and he couldn't see the whole thing, but he's not really attempting to make it look totally as if this were a photograph of cheese then rendering it as a painting. And the, oh, he's looking at us. What is this one? This one's bored, just waiting to see what's going on. Two look together, see, here, here comes the coffin under the drape right here. Don't you think you could recognize that person were we to see him? 
So they're good likenesses. However, Bobus knows these guys are. Compared to Fusharel. Well, you with all the layers of glazes, you would never see a brushwork. So in front of you at all times, this is a painting. Quite indifferent to the whole thing. Just waiting to get the body here to put it in. That crushed skull. The women of all ages, a youngster. The town tours out here. This is if someone sees us on this side, looking out at us. See how small they are compared to these. So these, they're just these strange disjunctions. And he does do just wonderful dogs. There's no getting around that. This one makes very clear the thick paint. Ah, uh, this image you see was taken right in front of the painting so you can see the surface of the canvas and the cracks in it and the thickness of the color. But how these are just rapid, broad, brushes of the color. It's easy to understand why this would have been very offensive to people, very startling. So we just have a couple of minutes, but this I, I can with, with just blithely say, oh, well, if this isn't a good reproduction, you know, you just go to the mat and see the original. This is a um, young woman from the village. And uh, let me give you the right type, young ladies of the village um, from a year later, 1851. Of course, now this was, had to be admitted into the salon and it was shown in the salon. and. For those of you who've seen it, it's another very, very big painting. Um, 76 inches by 102 inches or so. It's just big. Um, oh, Courbet thought the public would in, like this one and it did not. This painting came under such criticism. Some reasons of that criticism, I think we would hold as well because there's something wrong with the sizes here. These three young women who are his sisters uh, are presenting alms, really giving a, a, a gift of a kind of a cake to this young cow herd, whose cattle are far too small, far, far, far too small. Even if they have to go down a little uh, slope here to get to them, <clears throat> they're, they're just not in scale. And they don't seem to fit into the landscape. These people just across the road, they don't seem to fit into the landscape either. So you have a landscape, you have a painting of cows, you have a painting of an animal and a painting of people. They don't cohere. <clears throat> now, since he, <clears throat> you saw that scene he did of his father, the, the portrait, <clears throat> when he started, you know that this is an artist who could have done differently. This is a deliberate choice on his part to make something look like folk art, like provincial art, to make it part of something that was of his native or non culture. So that is another affront to the Parisian public when they see it. But, oh, the Parisians, oh, these girls. Mm. Their dress. I've, Outmoded clothing, too dressed up to be in the country. Um, 
The sister, she's not holding her parasol the right way. Instead of holding it up, she's propping it against her neck. So these are like country bumpkins aping the, the manners of the city. Um, and then there's the possibility is that this is what they looked like in the country and the way they wore their clothes and thinking it was right. So it's a, somewhat difficult to decipher. But this was the caricature of the time. Tells you so poignantly, pungently, what they saw wrong with it is even more than the subject. They said, oh, this is just like children's pool toys. There is no reality in it. Whereas in fact, the fact those are real people in a real, and that's a real landscape and events really did happen like that. But the presentation is not like anything they'd seen. All right. We stop with them. And <clears throat> beware, just for a moment, at the start next time, you will see this. This has been um, altered because it wasn't finished. At, um, and it was after Kubay Day at Zomrish. This was preparation of the dead girl for burial. This was a nude figure who was having her feet washed and her hair combed. And preparing the flowers, the burial cloth, all the gathering of the village. That's not a standard subject for art. All right, I will stop with that and we will be looking more at even at his most confrontational painting and some that are slightly less so. Next class. And anyone want to yeah. have me look at something, bring something back? Uh, what conversation? Yeah. Go with uh, the conversation. Yes, uh, the question, the second to last picture you showed, if there was so much criticism about, yeah, this one, yeah. Okay. How come that yeah. painting is still around? How come it just wasn't put aside, destroyed, or whatever? It's still being shown right now. Yeah. Um, very. Thank you for for bringing me back to another kind of reality. Mm. Um, that uh, Courbet to the broader public was just this obnoxious, unsettling. Figure, made you pay attention to things you didn't want to pay attention to. He also had very strong champions. Um, uh, socialist political thinkers saw this as a rallying cry for their, for their politics. And there was in literature also this great movement for, we need re the real world now. We, we were done with the past. We have to have something new. So he had ardent supporters. And um, that has helped to to maintain it, plus be kind of hard to think how you'd get rid of something this big. But that's why. And then you see, he's going to live long enough that he's going to influence people like Manet. Manet, the Impressionists, and the avant-garde of the later part of the century are going to look at him sort of as their father. So that attitude is also going to help to make sure these works are preserved. Good question. Uh, this um, who was in the salon that let him in? If they were so much against all this kind of oh, well, you see, that was the salon judges got hoisted by their own petard there because the rules had been forever, you know, at least for a hundred years. You had to pass the jury to get anything in, and that was extremely difficult. But um, because the judges had a pretty fixed idea of what they wanted. But once you were in, if the judges at any point said that your painting was worthy of a medal, anything else you put in, the rules were they would no longer object. You were, you were free of the whole jury system. You could just automatically submit them. 
No, I understand that, but how did it get in the first place? Well, I'm thinking that it may be because they like that one someone. painting. They like that one painting of the dinner at Ornan. And just because it was big? Well, no, because the two years before that, there had been the 1848 revolution. And there was for a while a kind of great liberal, oh, we need to open up so the, so that, you know, the lower classes did not revolt against their Parisian upper class. Um, so there was a, a kind of a temporary relaxation and then they tightened up again. But in that period of temporary relaxation, that's when his work was in. Thank you. So it's an, an incident of great timing. <laughs> More. Other questions? Another great question, because it's, it's true. I mean, it's like. If can you, you show, can you you show the very last uh, picture? Uh, let's see. Oh, this one. Oh, okay. Now, is that the corpse sitting on the chair there? Yes, the, to sell this painting, the, um, the, Courbet's, the rest of Courbet's family uh, uh, agreed to have this painted so it was to be looking as if it were uh, preparing a bride for his wedding. Well, <laughs> it's me. That would certainly not have, that would make Courbet turn over in his grave <laughs> if they were to, because think of what it, awesomely awful subject this was to show in a big painting, the preparation of the nude body of a girl. And, well, and what is she was starting to do a series of, of lives of women. And these aren't the subjects that were ordinarily shown about the lives of women, but one is that they prepare the bodies and then what better than to have a body of a woman. Are they holding a mirror in front of the corpse? It looks like she is reading something. Yeah, I know, but you see, this is, can you see how weird that face looks compared to the rest of this? This is all over paint. This is not Courbet's. When they did an x-ray, ah, no, that's not his doing. Because that's when they're trying to turn this into, this is like a bride being prepared. Which is pretty funny because to the ancient Greeks, the great moments in a woman's life when her status changed entirely, or when she got married and when she died. <laughs> Any more? No, all right, well. Thank you, Maggie. Thank sure. you, Maggie. Thank, Thank you. you. Lots more. Thank you, Maggie. Of this, wait till we look at this. Oh. oh my gosh. So can you imagine how people are gonna react to that? <laughs> Ooh. This artist is something else, right? <laughs> it's marvelous. All right. Goodbye. You can look forward to looking at her rearward. <laughs> so we'll see you next week again? Yes. Yes. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Yes. Thank you. Thank you.